Valentine's Day is supposed to be a day to celebrate the love you have for your partner. Romantic dinners, flowers, and chocolates. But Valentine's Day 2010 turned deadly for one husband and father. Stacy and Richard Shook were planning to meet at a park at night to exchange Valentine's cards, but what ended up happening to Richard was far more sinister. And the reasons given for his murder are disgusting and pointless. From the outside, it appeared Stacy and Richard Shook had a happy, solid marriage. They were married for less than three years. Richard was Stacy's fifth husband. He was described as being the best in her stable of husbands. He loved and even adopted her three sons and was considered a great father. Richard was a den leader at the Boys Cub Scouts and both were regular fixtures at their Scouts events. Both Stacy and Richard had good jobs. Stacy was the breadwinner of the family. She worked as head administrator for a large medical and surgical practice in DeKalb County, Georgia. Richard was a maintenance manager, but also took on the primary duties of raising the kids. But, as people say, you never know what is really going on behind closed doors. And in this case, that is absolutely true. So what happened to Richard? Was it a case of mistaken identity or a robbery gone wrong? Let's get into what happened on February 14th, 2010. On the last night of his life, Richard was preparing Valentine's Day dinner for Stacy and her grandparents, an elderly couple in need of 24-hour medical care. Stacy and Richard had Valentines to exchange for each other and gifts and cards. They were going to exchange them in the park, she decided. The nurse who was replacing her was running late, so she sent Richard ahead and instructed him to wait for her there. They drove along the dark, winding route in separate vehicles. Richard was the first to arrive, however, there was another person hiding in the shadows. It's an extremely isolated location with no pavement and no lighting, making it a really spooky place, especially at night. After 30 minutes, Stacy arrived and discovered Richard's bullet-pierced body covered in dirt and blood. The condition of his body made police question the motive. The murderer shot Richard two times in the abdomen, once to the chest and then two to the face. With all these bullets, police quickly ruled out robbery. With a robbery, I would think they would shoot once or twice and take the victim's belongings. We searched his truck and found there was $40 in the center console, stated one of the first detectives to arrive on the scene. He had his wallet, his wedding ring, and his watch on. If it were a robbery, then there was about a $40,000 truck sitting there idling that they could have jumped in and taken. He added that from the get-go, something just didn't smell right. The shooting appeared to be too over-the-top to be random. Richard was just a regular guy who was unarmed. He got there, and he was comfortable enough to get out of this truck and approach the person who ultimately shot him to death. And in the darkened night, the mystery killer was already gone by the time Stacy said she arrived at the secluded spot. That frantic voice is that of 38-year-old Stacy Sheck. Sheck had called Hall County 911 after she told police she discovered her husband, 47-year-old Richard Sheck, had been shot multiple times at Belton Bridge Park in Hall County. He's been shot! He is dead! At the time of Richard Sheck's murder, investigators only had a limited amount of information about how the Gwinnett County man ended up in the deserted park late on February 14th. <laughs> Stacy told dispatchers that when she pulled into the park to meet her husband, she knew immediately that something was wrong. As soon as I pulled into the park, I saw his truck. As soon as I pulled out, I could see him laying on the ground. Detectives scoured the crime scene for evidence, but there wasn't much to go on. Soft dirt that absorbed Richard's blood seemed to speak volumes to investigators, telling a chilling story. That soft dirt was very conducive to preserving tire impressions. Imprinted in the wet soil were three sets of tire tracks. In addition to the impressions left by Stacy's Ford Explorer and Richard's truck, the police also noticed a third set of impressions that came in from the park. They were easy to follow from the road. This told the police that the car that had made those impressions had been there before Richard arrived and had most likely left after he was killed. They also thought the tire tracks had to belong to the murderer, but it would be difficult to link them to a getaway vehicle, or would it have been? Before the cops left the scene, Stacy, the victim's distraught wife, made a shocking confession. She started telling them about an affair that she'd been having with a guy named Juan Reyes. I am in, you know, I'm in deep with Juan. Stacy told detectives in a recorded interrogation. 
That affair had been going on for several years, and immediately that sparked detectives' attention and got them looking at Juan as a prime suspect. Even though Juan Reyes had no medical experience, he was working right in Stacy's office. She hired Juan to work for her as a surgical assistant. She revealed to the police that Reyes had once been employed as a security officer at a nice hotel. Everything about the details seemed like a textbook crime of passion, Stacy's husband being hunted by a jealous boyfriend. When police asked her if she thought Juan was responsible, she said she didn't want to think that he was responsible, but she didn't know. Police discovered Juan Reyes was a father of many children who was divorced and in dire need of money. Reyes received gifts from Stacy, who also paid for his truck and phone and took him on romantic vacations. Juan even occupied a residence owned by Stacy. A secret apartment love nest was also being used. It made sense that Juan Reyes would be regarded as the prime suspect in the murder of Richard Sheck. The day following, he was detained by police. He even consented to speak with detectives without a lawyer present at the police station. He insisted that he was not connected to the murder. The detectives hammered Reyes with questions, and he even took a polygraph. The results were inconclusive. Juan did tell police that even though he was divorced, he was trying to get back together with his ex. He saw Stacy as a means to an end. His unemployed ex-wife was questioned as well. She did say that Juan and Stacy's relationship was too close, but that Juan was home at the time of the murder. Since his alibi was confirmed, he was cleared, going back to the crime scene and the tire tracks. Police determined the tire tracks belonged to the Goodyear Integrity brand, but because so many vehicles use these types of tires, finding the right truck would be very difficult. A lucky break happened for the cops. They received an unexpected tip that makes them wonder if Stacy was trying to rub out her fifth husband. Detectives received a call from an IT technician at Stacy's office. This tech's job was to clear out junk email from employee accounts. He said, When I went through Stacy's computer, I went to go ahead and empty her spam out of her inbox, but her inbox was completely empty for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The day of the murder. He thought that was very odd and also said, but I have backups of all of those if you guys would like to have them. The police of course said yes. Detectives urgently obtained a warrant for every email Stacy sent. Out of 4,000 emails, two of them raised an eyebrow. One of them was sent to a bank a few weeks before the murder. One email said, request to transfer $8,902 from a real estate account that the doctor's office had into the personal account of a lady named Lenitra Ross. Lenitra Ross was a medical assistant at the same practice where Stacy worked. Interestingly, a few days prior to that horrific Valentine's Day, there was another money transfer to Ross. On the Friday before the murder, SunTrust received a second request for a $1,100 transfer, which was also sent to Lenitra Ross's personal account. Police quickly found out that Lenitra was renting one of Stacy's houses. They paid Lenitra a visit, and she informed them she received roughly $8,900 for repairs on the rental house. Lenitra Ross said that she could provide repairs and for the water line repair. When Lenitra was interviewed, she said she also paid for half of the subsequent leak, which was a main water valve leak, so the total was roughly $10,000. Besides this, Stacy's cousin, Connie Hearn, came forward with a clue. She said she was concerned about her grandparents' car and wanted the police to take a look at it. Stacy was given a Chevy Impala to sell, with the proceeds going toward her grandparents' medical bills. But oddly enough, the Impala would vanish from Stacy's driveway for a few weeks, only to reappear out of nowhere. But what happened to the money? That never appeared. Stacy had claimed she got an, I believe, $14,000 out of it, but my grandparents never saw the money out of it. I thought that was weird, said Connie Hearn. What was even more odd was that the Impala had Goodyear Integrity tires the exact brand they were looking for. The vehicle was discovered parked at Linetra Ross's residence by the investigators. Who was driving this car the night Richard was killed? There was evidence at the scene based on the layering tire impressions that the offender lay in wait for Richard, said detectives. On a hunch, they investigated cell phone records. Phone records were subpoenaed from something called a tower dump. What is a tower dump? This is when you make a phone call. The tower records your number, the number you dialed, the date, the time, and the length of the call. Additionally, the tower saves that data. Four major carriers were served by the tower and thousands of pages of information, but the persistent investigator came up with an idea. Compare the numbers in Stacy's contact list with the numbers from the tower dump and see if a match appears. Detectives spent a good hour going through this information and found a number that was in Stacy's phone. 
This number made a call from Belton Bridge Park or the tower that services Belton Bridge Park on the night of the murder. At about 8.40 p.m., this phone call was very important due to the time it was made. The number associated with that call displayed in Stacy's contacts as Reggie, also known as Mr. Results. The number Reggie dialed was even more intriguing. The detective on the case stated he should have known the number because it was already in his notes. It was Linetra Ross. So he went back and took another look. So at 8.40 p.m. on February 14th, Reggie, Mr. Results, who is known to Stacy because he's in her cell phone contact list, called Linetra Ross from the park. But who exactly is Mr. Results? Detectives used Google the following day and discovered that Reggie was Reginald Coleman, a former semi-professional boxer and personal trainer who ran boot camp sessions at Stacy's workplace. The pieces started coming together. Detectives already felt this was a murder for hire case, and this new information pretty much solidified this theory. They believe Stacy was the leader of this triangle. Linetra received the money weeks leading up to the murder, and now this third person, Reggie, was involved. Reggie was at the park the night of the murder and made that phone call at 8.40 p.m., and police believe he made that call to Linetra to tell her it was done. Next were the bone-chilling texts. Linetra texted Stacy three minutes after the phone call, saying, Forgot to tell you I'm coming in late tomorrow. Happy Valentine's Day, by the way. That last sentence saying Happy Valentine's Day was a signal to Stacy from Linetra that the job was done and she can go find Richard. After this, detectives went through bank records of Stacy Shuck, Linetra Ross, and Reginald Coleman, which revealed thousands of dollars going between different accounts. Reggie received $10,000 in cash as payment for the murder. Linetra's payment for being the person that distributed money was that Stacy was going to deed a house to live in rent-free forever. At last, the final pieces of this vile puzzle were starting to fit together. They were looking at a murder for hire. They had to bring in the money element, and so once they had that with the financial records, they were ready to move forward with the arrests. Detectives called this Operation Tangled Web. It was such a large, coordinated effort that took a lot of planning. They served seven search warrants in four different counties and three arrest warrants all in one day. They had a big challenge, though. They had to arrest these criminals in such a way that they would not tip each other off. Reggie went down first, followed by Lenitra being apprehended at a traffic stop. Lastly, cops confidently went into Stacy's office, where a great deal of her planning was done. A person in that office told Stacy the police were there and to run, so Stacy retreated into the hospital and got herself to a place where she was inside a room that only had card access. She knew they couldn't get to her. Police quickly discovered that she was barricaded in that room. After a while, she gave up. Finally, Lenitra, Reggie, and Stacy were faced with some difficult questions three months after the brutal Valentine's Day murder of Richard Shock. Lenitra Ross played the innocent bystander in the interrogation room. Reggie used denial as his own strategy. Police claimed Linetra and Reggie consented to the murderous scheme solely to benefit financially. The crucial question remained, though. Why did Stacy wish for her husband's death? Stacy Shook told police that Richard was abusing her children in a shocking revelation. Stacy based her assertion on what she claimed one of the children told her. Investigators learned from Stacy that she was molested as a child. In order to safeguard her boys, she planned Richard's death. She confided in her work friend, Linitra Ross. Stacy said she did not want the police or a divorce. She wanted Richard dead if he was sexually abusing her kids. Stacy claimed that Linetra said she had a guy that can do the job, a man who was a boyfriend from time to time and father of her child, Reggie Mr. Results Coleman. This was a way for Reggie to supplement his income by doing these types of jobs. Linetra arranged a meeting where they came up with a plan to murder Richard in cold blood. Stacy said she told Reggie that her husband was messing with her kids and asked how much cash for the job. Reggie stated he was thinking around $10,000 and Stacy said okay. To make the deal even better, Stacy agreed to give Reggie her grandparents Impala. Linitra would get the house she was renting from Stacy. A week later, all three went to check out the potential crime scene at Belton Bridge Park. Reggie agreed it was the perfect place and he even said he may need to use this place more often. Makes me wonder how many jobs this guy has done to make such a casual statement. Unfortunately for this trio of killers, on the night of the murder, Reggie made a few mistakes. Stacy wanted this crime to look like a robbery, but Reggie did not take the victim's watch, truck, or money. She was very angry about this. The next big mistake he made was shooting Richard so many times. She wanted him shot one time in the head. She did not want him to suffer or see it coming. In the end, Stacy's son admitted that Richard did not touch him. 
He said, no, he said, I'm sorry I exaggerated. And he said, I'm sorry that I said those things. I blew those things out of proportion, Mom, said Stacy in the interrogation. The son claimed that Richard was a little bit more restrictive than she was on what they could do as children, so his comment had nothing to do with abuse. The real reason Stacy wanted the hit on her husband was because she didn't want to lose custody of her children in the event of divorce. Police believed she just wanted to live free of Richard and killing him was the only way to make it happen. District Attorney Lee stated, Stacy Shuck was controlling and manipulative. She used people to the extent that she needed them and beyond that, they just didn't matter. Lee also said that the three criminal masterminds believed they could outsmart small town cops with the perfect murder but they were very clearly wrong. With so much evidence against them, Stacy and Reggie entered a guilty plea and were found guilty of malice murder. Lenitra was found guilty of the same crime. All three are spending the rest of their lives behind bars. Stacy and Lenitra are at the Pulaski State Prison in Hawkinsville, Georgia. Reginald is at Smith State Prison in Glenville, Georgia. Stacy has been busy while incarcerated since her conviction. According to her family, she discovered God and was studying to become an ordained minister. Her three boys are adults now. Two of them have finished high school. The youngest was living with his father. What do you think of this case? Do you think life in prison is enough? Let me know in the comments your thoughts.